So I am Ed Royce, I'm Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. This is Mr. Elliot Engel, the ranking member of our committee. And what I wanted to convey was um, my appreciation for those of you who continue to try to spotlight the forgotten people in North Korea who are suffering under what the United Nations calls the worst human rights conditions in the world. Uh, I, I just have to tell you, we had a situation recently where we had nine North Korean refugees uh, escape into Laos, and they were turned back through China to North Korea. I don't know what has become of them. Many of them were teenagers. Our hearts go out. I, I wrote uh, uh, President Xi Jinping at the time, asking him, pleading with him, please follow the protocols from the United Nations do not turn them over to North Korea. Don't turn them over to the regime. I talked to a young girl um, whose brother was shot as a result of his trying to escape. Later she managed to escape. But it, it, is, just, it is just so tragic when you look through the findings of the Commission of Inquiry um, that, the, that the United Nations put together in order to look into these abuses. The reality is that under this regime, North Koreans have been denied, been denied every last freedom and every last bit of human dignity, whether it's freedom of speech or freedom of religion or freedom uh, of movement. We had a Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission hearing, and one of the dissidents there had actually been held in one of these work camps. And she told us she was denied the right to smile or to sing. That could have cost her her life. She was constantly beaten. Over 50 years, the North Korean regime has now operated the most oppressive system of political prisoner camps, and there are 120,000 prisoners currently enslaved. And many of them are starved or worked to death. Many are tortured, some are raped, some are executed for supposed crimes against the state. But we are here today not only to bring attention to their plight, but to call for action. Earlier this year, the most damning report ever compiled on North Korea was released, as I mentioned, by the UN Commission of Inquiry. And that report singles out North Korea as the worst human rights regime in the world today. And rightfully says that the regime has for four decades, pursued policies involving crimes that shock the con shock conscience of humanity. So in the coming weeks, the UN General Assembly plenary will consider a resolution condemning North Korea for its systematic and gross human rights violations, recommending that the top perpetrators be referred to the ICC. I strongly urge all members, all members of the UN to support this measure and demand accountability. On behalf of all who have suffered at the hands of the regime in North Korea, justice needs to be served. The work now is, is to implement the recommendations of the COI and determine how to prevent the regime from continuing to commit these un unparalleled human rights abuses. And another approach that we need to consider is the implementation of the strong sanctions included in H.R. 1771, measures that were previously used on North Korea to squeeze the regime almost a decade ago. And so uh, uh, we need to put an end to uh, the situation there. And I want to thank Susan Schulte and Rabbi Cooper for their continued devotion to human rights and to uh, the plight of the people of North Korea. And for years, these, uh, these refugees were voiceless. They were in the wilderness. Not anymore, thanks to them, their work, and thanks to your work. Uh, Mr. Ingram. Well, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate uh, Chairman Ed Royce for his leadership in hosting this event today and for his working with me as we have on so many other issues, working together because we share a, a common vision. Uh, I want to welcome and thank Suzanne Schulte and Rabbi Abraham Cooper. Uh, both who do such terrific work. I've worked with them, I've seen their work, and uh, it's just, uh, just uh, 
wonderful that they are involved. Um, they are the chair and vice chair of the North Korea Freedom Coalition, obviously for the tireless work on behalf of human rights in North Korea. I have one up on the chairman. I've actually been to North Korea twice, <laughs> um, but only to Pyongyang. Uh, they didn't let us go uh, any place else. And I think it's, it's fair to say that the regime uh, in Pyongyang is the most oppressive, as the chairman said, and the scariest regime on earth where people literally uh, cannot be, be human beings. Everything is so controlled uh, by the government, what you can say, what you can do, what you can look like. Uh, it's just uh, a sad, sad state of affairs. Um, but this is the worst of it. The years we've heard reports about the abuses endured by the people of North Korea, torture, starvation, forced labor, and execution all at the hands of the regime in Pyongyang. The United Nations Commission of Inquiry uh, report this year confirmed those reports. <coughs> I'm quoting it, they called the North Korean regime responsible for, quote, systematic widespread and gross human rights violations, including crimes against humanity, unquote. So I told you I've been there myself, and I can recall the repressive chill in the air uh, in that country. The unmistakable freedom that I was standing in a place that didn't know freedom. The unmistakable feeling that I was standing in a place that didn't know freedom. And you know when you contrast it with South Korea, same people. Uh, it's like night and day. It's just amazing. The chairman and I share a deep commitment to addressing the injustices endured by the North Korean people. Earlier this year, our committee worked on a bill to improve enforcement of sanctions against North Korea. We passed that bill in the House. Today I want to call, as the chairman did, special attention to the fate of North Korean refugees who are forcibly repatriated or trying to escape this cruel regime. North Korean refugees take personal risk, great personal risk, in fleeing Kim Jong-un's oppression. Last year, nine young North Koreans took that risk. They made it as far as Laos. The government there sent them to China, and ultimately they ended up right where they started, in the grasp of North Korea's abusive rule. Under international law, states can't do anything that would lead a person back to a country where his or her life or freedom may be threatened. Now, we don't know what happened to these young people, nine young people. We're concerned for their safety. But because we know that refugees who are repatriated to North Korea often suffer grievous fates, we're concerned and we're worried about them. So it's time for North Korea's leaders to be held accountable for the atrocities which rank among the worst since World War II. And we've had lots of atrocities, unfortunately, but theirs are the worst. This sort of brutality has no place in the 21st century, and I urge the United Nations General Assembly to vote in favor of referring this case to the International Criminal Court. And we should be clear, for the regime in Pyongyang to associate a legitimate human rights inquiry with another rogue nuclear test would be irresponsible and dangerous. The North Korean regime should stop their saber rattling, honor their commitments regarding their nuclear program, and return to the table for the six party talks. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And Suzanne, unfortunately, as you know, there's a vote on the yes. floor. You heard the bill go off? Elliot and I are going to race each other to try to make the vote. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. First, I, I do wish to express my deep thanks to Congressman Ed Royce and, and Congressman Elliot Engel on behalf of the North Korea Freedom Coalition for their leadership on the North Korea human rights issues and their sponsorship of H.R. 1771, which I know passed the Congress unanimously because of their efforts in working together in a bipartisan fashion. In fact, um, Rabbi Abraham Cooper and I started this year off at the Museum of Tolerance with Congressman Engel as he was one of the leaders in speaking out, uh, condemning the basketball diplomacy of Dennis Rodman that was masking the horrors that were being committed in North Korea. At this very same time as the Commission of Inquiry is about to release their report on the crimes against humanity, Dennis Rodman was, was uh, playing basketball with the dictator. Um, our purpose for being here this morning is to call for specific action regarding the atrocious human rights violations being committed against the North Korean people, including the children of North Korea, uh, by the Kim Jong-un regime, Jong regime and 
by North Korea's neighbors. The incident we are highlighting this, this afternoon is the human face of this ongoing tragedy. We're releasing a statement this afternoon from MJ, the missionary who rescued these children, and members of our North Korea Freedom Coalition will highlight each child by sharing some thoughts from MJ about them. We realize that the DPRK is now claiming that the children are all being wonderfully treated in the warm embrace of the dictator, and that there's, but there's been disturbing reports that have emerged from people that have escaped North Korea in recent months that they were tortured and may in fact the oldest two were executed. We're not sure the truth of what's going on here, but we do know that all of a sudden, as soon as people started asking about these children, that all of these videos started showing up on the North Korea website, which just underscores the point that we have to raise our voices about these incidences. There are hundreds and hundreds of North Koreans that have been forced against their will back to North Korea. And many of them, most of them, we have no idea of their fate. So we are releasing today letters calling for specific actions, letters we've sent that have already been mailed and emailed and sent to the governments of China, Laos, and Russia, as well as to Ban Ki-moon, calling for specific action to determine the well-being and status of these children. In fact, since this incident occurred in May of 2013, we've repeatedly called on China and Laos to account for the well-being of these children, but also never, ever again to repatriate refugees and to work with the UNHCR to safely resettle refugees. In addition, we have called for these member nations to support the Commission of Inquiry's referral of North Korea to the International Criminal Court, and we are once again calling on the United States Senate, specifically Senators Robert Menendez and Robert Corker, to take up the North Korea Sanctions Enforcement Act that Congressman Royce and Engel have successfully gotten passed unanimously in the House of Representatives. We simply must stop the flow of money to the Kim Jong-un regime and, and, and his, the people in his regime because this is what is enabling him to continue these crimes against humanity. All of these requested actions are in the letters that we're releasing today. I want to be sure everyone gets a copy of the packet with all these information. We do not know how these nine young people are doing. But one thing for certain we do know, MJ and his wife saved the lives of these children and others that were being sheltered. They gave up their own safety and their own well-being to nurture these children back to life. Several made it to South Korea, several made it to America, as we've depicted in the poster behind me. However, the last nine orphans, just at the point that they thought they were going to be going to South Korea from Laos, were forced back to North Korea, even though they made it clear they wanted to go to South Korea, even though South Korea had agreed to accept them, even though repatriation of North Korea means certain torture, certain imprisonment, and sometimes even execution. The fact is the governments of Laos and the People's Republic of China decided to honor the request of the DPRK, not the government of South Korea, or what was in the best interest of these innocent young people. Now, I would like to read a few excerpts from MJ's own statement and introduce you to Laos 9. We are making available today MJ's entire statement. These are MJ's words. In the winter of 2009 in China, I met the Kochabis, the Kochabi children, for the first time. Most of the children were eating what they could find in trash cans and were sleeping in the sewers in freezing conditions. I have seen with my own eyes the Chinese patrol guards beat Kochibi children with clubs and metal brushes. Our children were physically beaten so much that their heads were covered with bald spots because the hair would no longer grow back from the trauma. My wife and I live with these children and know firsthand that North Korean defectors in China have no basic human rights or privileges and are only treated as objects for sale. Objects sold for cheap as laborers or sold for the harvesting of their organs. Women are forcefully prostituted and live as slaves for the profit of Chinese people. This is the reality of North Korean defectors. To see these children and not to do anything would have been unconscionable. So starting in 2009, we started to bring the Kochimi children to our home to live as a family. 
my wife and I did our best to teach the children who had been living on the streets how to read, to write, and socialize so that they could eventually live in society. In those circumstances, there were many difficulties, but the children called us mom and dad and thought of us as a family. This made it all worthwhile. We were living in fear on a daily basis, and as a result, lived very quietly as if our house was vacant. And if we felt something was suspicious, we moved as quickly as possible. We lived like this and moved repeatedly. When we felt the children were ready for life in South Korea, we sent three at a time from China to South Korea. Then we rescued three more and safely resettled them in America. In 2013, my wife's health was in such poor condition that she could not help care for the children in her home. We then decided to go to South Korea with all nine children via Laos. We started our journey in April 2013, making it to Laos. Now, those are MJ's words, but imagine as you see these pictures and hear the reflections on these children and hear about how these nine were told, imagine this, they were told on the morning of May 27th by the Lao authorities, pack your bags, you're going to South Korea. As they rushed, started to walk down the stairs to leave that detention center, excitedly, excitedly thinking they were going to South Korea, they were separated from MJ and his wife. MJ and his wife were locked up in that detention center, and the children were forced to board a plane that went to China and then immediately on to North Korea. So I just want you to imagine the, these children, and I would like to call on our vice chairman, a dear friend, the associate dean of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, Rabbi, 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 I'm sorry, Rabbi Abraham Cooper, who has been a dear friend, and as I mentioned, Vice Chairman of the North Korea Freedom Coalition, who will begin the reflections on our, our nine. Rabbi Cooper. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to uh, read a little background on uh, the oldest of the group, a young man by the name of Moon Shoal. Uh, before that, I would just like to make some additional uh, comments first to add my thanks to uh, Chairman Royce and uh, Congressman Engel, a Republican and Democrat who uh, live up to a standard of cooperation and bipartisanship on human rights that has almost uh, been uh, wiped away from contemporary uh, uh, Washington. And we hope that their leadership, not only on North Korea, but especially will inspire the new Congress that comes in to, um, when it comes to the issue of human rights, to do what Americans expect, that we speak in one voice on behalf of um, young people like the nine we're going to hear about today. Uh, two other comments. You know, this is, I live in Los Angeles, but this is a beautiful time of year to come to Washington, right between Thanksgiving and uh, Christmas, New Year's, Hanukkah just a great time. It's also a time of year when tens of millions of Americans give no thought to getting on an Amtrak train or getting on an airplane or in their car and figuring out some way how to crisscross the country and make sure that they spend time with their loved ones who may be in three or four or five or six different cities. They'll find the house of prayer. Uh, it's just something that is sort of instinctive for every American. And to bring down today's event on terms that the average person in the United States can think about is, imagine a place where all of the freedoms that we take for granted are not even part of dreams anymore. They're not even part of a fantasy. It's completely disconnected from that situation. And so you heard the overall um, picture of what happened to these nine young people who obviously risked their lives to leave North Korea, and no one claims that they uh, rushed to, uh, to get back to their quote-unquote homeland. And again, we don't know what happened to them. We're not going to conjecture. We're here to um, let them know through the media uh, and uh, let the, rec the people here in the United States, greatest country in the world, to let them know that they and their situation are not forgotten. One last point, and that is that this incident of the forced repatriation of Moon Shul and the other eight you'll hear about represents a permanent stain on the government of Laos for uh, allowing itself 
uh, to work in uh, such a nefarious manner with uh, North Korea and China uh, in order to see to it that nine young people would be robbed of a future with hope. That is, uh, you could call it a crime against humanity, call it what you wish, but it means the government bringing down the full force of its power to deny these kids their freedom. And one last word, and that is to the government of China. We understand that the uh, announcement just came out in the last few days that China now has the most robust, powerful economy in the world. It's now number one. It's time for the Chinese government to behave as an appropriate world power when it comes to the issue of human rights. And this incident in which uh, they uh, in worked uh, with, uh, with North Korea uh, to do to bring these kids back to North Korea is unbecoming of a world power. So we would hope that the people who make the decisions uh, in that country uh, know you can't have it both ways. If you want to be a true world power, you have to step up and uh, live up to and take the lead in the arena of human rights. And if anything is going to change at Pyongyang, that leadership of change must come from Beijing and we hope and pray that it will take place. Moon Chol, 19, suffered from frostbite on his feet. There was no place in the area of refuge where he could receive medical care. So he had to personally cut off three of his own frostbitten toes. Despite the difficulty walking due to his injuries and all that he suffered. Everything we know about Moon Shul presents a picture of a young man who always had a kind heart, who led him to take care of the younger Kochi Bees and give them food, whenever that food could even be found, to see to it that they got food first. Because of Moon Chul's kindness and caring for you, Kwang Yuk, who is much weaker, Kwang Yuk has survived. We don't know the fate of this young man. I hope and pray that he's alive. But the message we send back to North Korea and around the world is, you're not forgotten. Beck Young Won. Upon hearing his mother's dying wish that he find her relatives in South Korea, Young Won and a friend risked their lives to cross the Yalu River and escape North Korea. His friend sadly died in the river. Young Won became more determined to make it to South Korea and hoped most of all to one day meet his relatives in South Korea. He was the newest child to come to the shelter but got along well with all the other children. Jung Kwang Young, age 18. When Kwang Young defected and was in China, he was so hungry that he tried to steal a dog so that he could eat it, and he was caught and beaten severely. Kwang Young would be described as a, a people person. He loved to meet new people. And he likes to be stylish, and as you can tell, the smile on his face, he enjoyed life. Ryu Kwang Hyuk. This young man was unable to beg or steal for food because he felt great shame for his condition. When Moon Chol found him, he was nearly starved to death, but Moon Chol kept Kwang Hyuk alive, making sure he had food. Kwang Hyuk's dream is to get an education and one day serve the poor. Lee Kwang Hyuk, 17, is a very wise young man who hopes to receive a good education in South Korea. He felt angry and frustrated that he was not able to receive education as a child in North Korea. Kwang Hyuk felt a great deal of resentment for having to live as a Kochabi and have no education. <coughs> this is Park Kwang Hyuk, and you are 17. 
Kwangyo was always missed having a family and wanted to experience the love of being part of one. He considered MJ and his wife to be his parents and didn't want to be separated from them. As a result, he ended up living with them for three years. More than a safe place, Kwangyo needed a family. He had a great passion for learning and always had a lot of questions. Liu Chaoryong, 16. When Chaoryong first arrived at MJ's home, he was so small for his age that he was able to pass himself off as a seven-year-old. Chaoryong had been living on the streets with his father as a kotebi, but when his father kept drinking and beating Chaoryong and not providing food, Chaoryong had no choice but to run away and flee to China. Chang Kukwa, age 15. Kukwa has a beautiful singing voice and always sang along with South Korean singers on TV. She worked as a cook at the detention center for Kutsebi in Changmo. Learning about South Korea, she would compare her life with South Korean teenagers. She asked herself, how could it be that every day she faced hardship and physical abuse? But South Korean teenagers live so much better lives. Bo Ye Chi is the youngest at 14. Ye Ji survived in North Korea by begging and was eventually sold to Chinese people to work on a farm. The hardship was unbearable for her, which led her to escape and was repatriated back to North Korea. AG was sold to China and repatriated in this manner two more times, and eventually MJ and his wife rescued her. She would say to us many times, I am only 14 years old, but life is too hard for me to bear. AG wanted to go to South Korea very badly and wanted to live a normal life like other kids her age. <coughs> well, we just wanted to share those thoughts with you because that's the human face of the tragedy that's happening every day in China. It's facing North Koreans that are trying to escape. And the situation there is somebody who's worked on this issue for 18 years, I believe is worse today than ever because of the crackdown that started when Kim Jong-un assumed power. The crimes against humanity in North Korea are happening today. And they're happening in that country and the way outside of that country and how other countries conspire to support that regime rather than helping these North Koreans that are fleeing. I just want to call your attention the packet of information that we have that includes the specific requests that we've made of the government of China, the government of Laos, even the government of Russia, because they have a vote in the Security Council. The rumor is that the COI report will get to the Security Council level and that either China or Russia will veto it. In light of the continuing horrific conditions of North Korea, and as Rabbi Cooper mentioned, we're calling on China to show leadership, support this, and not veto it. Because the future is with South Korea. And they should not continue to count time to the dictatorship of Kim Jong-un. There's also a letter that, uh, it's, it's a letter that we have written many times. Louise, who heads up our legislative committee, and Peter Kang is sitting here with our coalition. Many, many visits to the offices of Senator Menendez and Senator Corker, pleading with them to pick up the North Korea Enforcement Sanctions Act. So we're renewing that call today. There's a copy of the letter that we sent, uh, that they hand delivered many times to those offices, uh, to, to take up in the Senate what Elliot Engel and Ed Royce passed, supported and passed in the House of Representatives. And now I'd be glad to, uh, to take any questions that you may have. But again, I do want to call your attention. Be sure to get, get the information. MJ's complete testimony and statement is also there. And we've been in regular communication with him throughout this uh, preparation for this pep conference. So if you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer them, or try to answer them. Any? Okay. Yes, sir. I'm Yusen from Yanam News Agency in Korea. The North Korea recently released some video which shows the most of them are living while in North Korea after they got back. But do you believe that video? Um, I have not seen it. I have certainly heard about it. I've had some people analyze it. I can just tell you that we don't know for certain 
But I find it very interesting that as soon as the story started to emerge and was reported by the media in South Korea, that the two oldest children had been executed and the younger seven had been sent to a political prison camp, all of a sudden, after almost a year of silence, all of a sudden these videos started showing up on the pro-North Korea website. I find the timing extremely suspicious, but what this tells us, two things. Number one, we need the media to continue to investigate this. And we need to call on China, Laos, the UN to say, okay, fine, North Korea, if this is true, let the UNHCR interview these children. They were refugees, they had asked for assignment. As far as we're concerned, they're among the disappeared. There was a complaint that, um, that MJ did file with the UN, the, the committee that deals with victims of torture, victims of disappearances. There's an ongoing claim. Let's let the UN pursue, pursue this and let's get to the bottom of this and find out. But again, it is so important. It's what our coalition is trying to do is to raise these individuals' names ever before us until we know for sure they're safe. And I want to point out on our website, there is a, 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 a document that we call the list. It is hundreds and hundreds of names of people that were forced back to North Korea, most of whom we have no idea where they are. And I would just call that to everyone's attention. We've tried to document every incident that we know of. Those hundreds and hundreds of names represent thousands and thousands and thousands of people, just like the young ones that you, you see pictured behind you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Olivia Enos from the Ridge Foundation. Um, my question is twofold. One, what do you think is the most valuable thing that NGOs and also private individuals can be doing to shed light on what's going on in North Korea? But in particular, what can we do to shed more light on China's open, openly flagrant dismissal of international law in, in forcibly re repatriating Koreans? Well, first of all, I think that helping give voice to the North Koreans is very important. And with an NGO, especially giving them a chance to testify, giving them a chance to speak out, I credit the, the North Korea human rights movement as having gotten great traction because of the defectors speaking out. And just knowing that from my own experience and hosting the first defectors that ever came here, it was not until so many had come out, so many have told their stories, so giving them the opportunity to testify and get their testimonies out because the media can't go to North Korea and report, and the media can't go to China. As you know, Laura Lang and Luna Lee, the reason why they ended up in, in prison in Pyongyang is because they were trying to document the trafficking of North Korean women in China. So it's very difficult for reporters to really have the ability to tell, to, to, to report on what's actually happening in North Korea. So that's why it's important to get the testimonies out. And then the second question is about China. This is um, something that we know that the people of China are on our side. Every time we speak at a college event, every time we speak at a, a, a different forum where there's Chinese students there that, that are here that hear about this, they're totally on our side. It's the government of China that needs to be pressured on this. And we've especially called on South Korea to do more because there's a Korean way. Korea, South Korean culture is extremely popular in China. And this is a time when we really need to pressure the government of China, the South Koreans, as well as the, as the US, as well as the UN, to stop this brutal, inhumane repatriation policy, which has caused such horrible suffering for the North Korean people. Not only is it a violation of international law, but it's unnecessary. Because North Korean refugees are unlike any refugees in the world, in that they have automatic citizenship in the Republic of South Korea. So there's absolutely no reason for them to be repatriated. So I think continue to raise the, the voice, raise our voices about what's happening and, and continue to call for China to stop the repatriation, repatriation policy is absolutely critical. But also one other thing too, and you didn't ask me this, but radio broadcasting, getting information in North Korea is critical because there is an information explosion in North Korea that we need to, uh, to get as much information as we can. And it is so important that because so much information is getting into North Korea, that those children will know that people on Capitol Hill were calling out their names. And I can tell you in my own experience, incidences where I've heard of people who were greatly encouraged because their names were called out. And one that comes to mind was a humanitarian worker who was in jail in China that thought he was forgotten. And he called his name out and he heard it on the radio broadcast. 
So raising our voices and speaking out is absolutely critical because information is getting into North Korea more and more, especially when you have so many, so many people who escape North Korea that are communicating with their family members. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, as you said, despite uh, Chinese people on outside, uh, uh, Chinese government uh, is not stopping the repatriation policy because uh, if uh, uh, defectors stop coming, North Korean uh, regime will collapse. If China doesn't want that. Uh, you have been writing, and we have been writing many, many, many letters to China to persuade them. But uh, they understand uh, you know, our appeal, but uh, they are not doing it the way we want. So do you think if we keep writing them later, uh, will that sometime work? Or don't we need some kind of a different strategy? Or is uh, the current uh, very uh, active uh, you know, uh, resolutions uh, going on in the uh, United States, I mean, United Nations committees, you think this will help, or, or we need something different? Because if we keep the same, same, same or similar error, you know, uh, you know, all the time, uh, I don't know whether it will really work. Yeah. Well, that's why I said that you have to. South Korea has to do more to pressure China. Their uh, trade I mean, relationship is in, enormous. I mean, what is eight hundred expected to cost like eight hundred fifty billion dollars over the next ten years? The the South Korea needs to do more to press on this issue, and so does the United Nations. That is their responsibility. China is a signatory to the Convention on Refugees. It is violating international law. It is violating an agreement that is pledged, that is signed in 1982. So I, we, so you're talking about our coalition. Of course, I'm saying we should do more. We can, that we need to continue to do what we're doing. But we, of course, others need to do more. The UN needs to do more. The government of South Korea needs to do more. We can't do this all on our own. But having events like today to expose these kinds of things that are happening are also another way that we can get this message out. And as again, I think I know that the Chinese people are very sympathetic to what our views are on this, that they're embarrassed that their own government is committing these horrible acts. They have created this crisis by not following international law. And we need to continue to focus on that and put pressure on China on that. So other questions? I'm going to take one more if, um, if there's any more. Okay. Again, be sure to get a copy of the letters because it has specific information on what we're calling on these different governments to do. And thank you all for, uh, for being here today and for showing your interest in this, this situation. And I just want to thank all the members of our North Korea Freedom Coalition for being here to speak out on behalf of these nine children. Thank you very much. Thank you.